I am honored to be introducing to you Dr. Dan Gottlieb, and I say his name formally. Dan's a very close heart friend, a dear friend. He's been a psychologist for about five decades, and uh, many of you know him as a public radio host, Voices in the Family from Philadelphia, super popular call-in radio show. That's been for over 30 years, just stopped last year, I think it was. And you also know him probably as the author of Letters to Sam and The Wisdom We're Born With, and he's got a new one uh, coming out soon, so stay attuned. So if you're not familiar with Dan, you will discover, as I have, uh, he's got just this wonderfully warm, bright heart. So welcome to you, Dan. Oh, thank you, Tara. It's so good to be with you. Oh, I've been so looking forward to this. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, just to start, just to share, how's your heart today? How are you? How's my heart today? Um, it's very open and loving at the moment, being with you. I mean, seeing seeing your smile, feeling your heart um, feels tender and open and loving. When I was practicing just now, um, I, I just experienced myself holding my tender heart. Um, mm. So that's how I am mm. today at the moment. <laughs> That sounds really lovely. <laughs> so I have a lot of things that, as you know, because I've been emailing you, a lot of things I thought it'd be really juicy for us to explore together. But the place that I wanted to start is, to me, the one that jumps out is that you have more well-being, more, more happiness, uh, than most people I've ever met. And I, I, I just want to name that there's all this happiness research out now. And it basically says that we humans mispredict what's going to make us happy. You know, we, if we think if we're going to win the lottery or lose weight or get that raise, that then we're going to be happier. And we think if someone dies or a relationship crashes or we lose our vision or something, that then we're going to be really unhappy and research shows we always we go back to this kind of set level of course meditation can change the set level but we go back so here you are and you're one of the happiest people i know and i guess i'd like you to share because you've endured some of the greatest losses people endure how you land up being this grateful happy person you know just to share a bit on that I never was before my accident. And P.S. I've got a history of of depression, and I float in and out of it. Somehow, it doesn't affect my baseline happiness. Um, after the accident, I told my family that I would give it three years because I didn't know if I could live with this quadriplegia thing for the rest of my life. So I. I said I'd give it three years and, and I would decide then whether I was going to go on or not. But at the end of three years, give or take, I, I sat alone and I asked, negotiated with, uh, I don't know, a higher power, or a deeper truth. And I said, okay. I said, I'll live with it. But give me hope that one day I'll walk again. And I knew I'll never walk again. And then I said, give me hope that I won't be so sick. Those first few years I was in and out of hospitals over and over. And I knew that truth too. That I no hope. And, and, and I said, okay, I'll live with it. I'll do it for the sake of my daughters, my wife, my parents, my sister. And then I thought, well, I'll do it for the sake of my patients and friends. And then I realized I did it 
because I want to live. I love having a life. Um, and that kind of changes everything to appreciate living, to be grateful just for living. I, I was in South Africa about five years ago, and I was taken to a school for disabled children down there, very impoverished, airy, impoverished school. And, and there were kids of all ages with all kinds of disabilities. All the teachers were volunteer. The founder of the school was a very old woman now. She lived in a little hut on the grounds. And every time I saw her, she had a big smile on her face. So she comes out of her hut one day. She's on a cane. She's bent over with arthritis, obvious pain, and a big smile on her. So I said to her, you always seem to be so happy. Are you? She said, oh, yes, I'm happy. I said, what makes you happy? She said, as long as my hut is clean, I'm happy. <laughs> You know, you set the bar down that low, you have to win, you know? That one wouldn't work for me. I just can't manage keeping the hut clean, but yeah, exactly. it's a great. <laughs> yeah, you know, I realized that I asked you that question and there are some people listening that don't really know your story about the accident. So you may backtrack a little bit and share other lessons you've gotten from it well Tara, if you don't mind i'd like to go back before please the accident. i'd like to go back to seventh grade when my teacher introduced me to psychology and as i learned about it i knew i was going to be a psychologist i wanted to be i was going to be that was at 12. That same teacher who I idolized sexually abused me on two occasions. And what that did to me was, of course, like almost everybody who experiences that kind of trauma, I felt shame. I had my secret. I felt different. And I felt less that. And I carried that feeling through college and graduate school, through my early career, my kids, my marriage. The sense of, they say I'm good, but if they only knew, they say they love me, you know the mantra, Tara. And then I had a car accident when I was 33 years old, um, 41 years ago. And at first that didn't do anything for my self-esteem, of course. It took years, I mean, years of suffering and depression and you know the story of the emperor's new clothes where, you know, culminates he's riding around naked and he doesn't know he's naked. I became like the emperor who knows he's naked and is still okay. If you're naked long enough and you know damn well, there's nothing you can do about it. You adapt, you learn to live with it. Um, and that's what I've done with sexual abuse, with quadriplegia, with um, all the losses I've experienced, the death of my wife and my sister. Um, I've learned, I know 
when the heart breaks, it heals. It, it's not magic. I'm not resilient or strong or any of that. I'm human. And I'm happy to report that. I know that you have that on your business card. I read that you, Dan Gottlieb, human. You kind of left out all the uh, initials. <laughs> I just put down the important thing. It is the important thing. And when you say it's being adaptive and you and I were talking about this, it's it's the great gift of life that there's some intelligence in life that wants to live no matter what. And I, I know for myself, I, you know, my downward spiral with health where I didn't think I was going to be able to move much anymore my prayer was, please, may I love this life no matter what, no matter how much is taken away. But as with you, um, what allowed that? Because I did, I was in a period where I didn't know what I, if I'd ever, I didn't think I had any reason to hope for anything, you know. What allowed it was the grief. I had a grief grieve what I was losing, just let this body grieve what it grieves, you know. And it was the heartbreak that broke open that I felt I felt a sense of being held by love. And so love made it worth it. Feeling held by love made life worth it. And then I started being able to see the little things. I thought I had to have Act, physical activity, the stuff I used to love, like, you know, running and swimming and so on to be happy. And I found out that I could look at the fern in my bedroom and see the grace of its leaves and be happy or play with my puppy, you know. So that's what shifted it. And I've gotten better. And now I see myself attached again to feeling better and know I will have to grieve again. It's not like I've learned how to love life no matter what. I'll have to re-grieve losing. It happens every round, but at least I know the pathway. Yeah, as does your body. You yeah, know? My body knows the pathway. That's a better way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember reading Tuesdays with Maury, and um, as Maury deteriorated or began to, he said to Mitch Album, his student, the author of the book, he said, oh my God, one day somebody's going to have to wipe my ass. And I remember a flash in my mind went, you get used to it. I got used to it. I hated it at first, but you get used to it. It's, you know, this is my life. You know, you get used to it, but I feel like you do more than getting used to things, Dan. So I'm just going to invite invite something more about this because you really do depend on people and people depend on you and when i sense that relational field around you it feels tender and beautiful so it's more than you've gotten used to it it feels like you live in a real beautiful interchange am i projecting <laughs> or is that how it is no um those around me do love me and I feel their love and I love them. I mean, my nurses, I'm, I'm blessed to have the kind of insurance where I have 24 hour nurses. Um, my nurses, I've been with them through episodes of depression or, or loss or um, divorce. Um, I've been with them through their children who have gone through difficulties. Um, and of course, they've been with me. You know, it's, it's, you're right, it's an intimate, tender, caring relationship. But I, it goes beyond that, Tara, I feel that way with, of course, Joan, my loved one, um, my daughters, but my friends, you know, close and far out. Um, I, I feel 
love towards them. And, uh, I found over the course of the last, whatever, three, four decades, that um, love is habitual. That the more you do it, the easier it is to do. That's, I love it. What you practice grows stronger. I get that. And so here's what I'm wondering. So many people have a hard time letting in love. They just have a hard time letting in love. And you let it in. Like I can feel you get touched. And you certainly know how to give love. But how do you practice letting in love if it feels so threatening or scary or just impossible? I spent a long time not letting it in um, because of shame and, and unworthiness. Um, Tara, I don't have an answer. I really don't. I mean, you know, I'm a therapist. I could make something up. <laughs> no. We get enough of made up stuff in this world. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, I really don't. I, my heart just did open. I just, I, I gave up disbelief. Hmm. Mm. I gave up disbelief. That's really, I mean, what stops us from letting in love is a belief that in some way we're not worthy and something bad will happen if we let it in, then they'll find out that we're not worthy or that we'll get betrayed later on. Um, it's habitual, so you let go of disbelief. Yeah, and that fear, you know, it's, it's like love. I mean, you got to be fearless to love. You know, you could get your heart broken. To love fearlessly, you know, you have to be willing to risk having your heart broken with confidence that you'll be okay after, like you say, Tara, after we grieve, after, you know, there's a, a Sufi saying, it goes when the heart weeps for what it's lost, the soul rejoices for what it's found. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. Yeah. I know for myself, as I'm, you know, I'm posing that question to myself, um, I get that when I can be vulnerable, you know, if I can just take the chance to be vulnerable, my heart finds out that it's safe. And it doesn't mean being vulnerable with everybody in every situation, but just practice leaning in that direction. So I feel like when I first started teaching, I presented a much more I tried to present a together persona that kind of knew about stuff. And I, like you just did, and I love that you did it, that you modeled, okay, you're, I don't know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and there's something about it being okay to not have the answers. There's something about knowing that the conditioning still in me to, um, go to sleep in so many ways and to be able to name it out loud and name it each time I do it it becomes safer to just let love in and out yeah yeah um, you know back to the emperor's new clothes <laughs> you know I, I am lucky I can't hide my vulnerability I am so lucky in that way. And, and you know, it's in our hard wiring. My vulnerability brings out the best in people. Vulnerability opens people's hearts. Look, look at my riches as a result of that. You're on a fast track. When, when you can't hide it, you're on a fast track. Mm -hmm. And I get that. I'm curious, though, because there are a lot of people whose vulnerabilities right out there and they're very sensitive to how others respond. And I'm wondering if there's anything 
you can say to me and to us on how we respond to your vulnerability and others that you know of? One of the chapters in the book um, I'm working on is um, Call Me Cripple. Now that's an awful word. I don't care what people call me. I can feel their hearts. So if, if people call me, whatever the word is, I, I don't know, disabled these days, differently abled, I, I don't know. Um, but yet they're, they're doing it in, in a way where, they're, where their heads turn emotionally. Um, sometimes it hurts. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I just hurt. Sometimes I feel compassion mm -hmm. for them and I want to reach out to them to make them feel better. And sometimes I'm reactive. Mm -hmm. And I say something. Um, and I know when I'm reactive, it's because I'm feeling more insecure at that moment. Mm -hmm. So I get reactive. What people need to know when they see someone who's different. It's like the name on my card. I suffer. I want peace in my life. I love. I want well-being. And I want my family to experience love and security. That's all. That's me. Yeah, I'm sitting in a wheelchair and my hands don't work. But the important stuff, that's me. That's you. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing, that what you want me to see is you're just like me, you know, that we both are these humans feeling these things. And if I can, to not turn away. Those are the two messages I just got. Yeah. Yeah, hold me and I'll hold you. Well, I remember when you shared with me um, that wonderful piece about the redwoods and how they're super tall and what allows the redwoods to stand strong in the storms is they have shallow root systems, but they're all connected. <laughs> yeah. And it's like if we get all self-conscious and protective about our vulnerability and don't share it, then we don't actually get to recognize and see that it's universal and that together we really become, when we feel our togetherness, we can become fearless, that that is the way to become fearless. You know, this horrible election and sequelae, um, even before, um, what I see on both sides, the argument, the anger on one side, the righteous indignation on the other, you scratch the surface, you see fear, fear of change, fear of loss, even, even Tara, that horrible march in, in um, Charleston, um, KKK and the, and the um, neo-Nazis, the phrase was, Jews will not replace us. Well, what's the emotion behind that phrase? It's fear of being replaced. So we're all feeling the same thing, but don't know it. It's true. That was one of the things I wanted to talk some about is um, if there's any one conversation or question that seems predominant, I can see it on the Saturday satsangs we have. It's like, how do I talk to this person who we have such different views and I feel really angry. You know, it's like if that person's view is um, I shouldn't have to wear a mask, but their view threatens me because then they're not wearing a mask and I'm threatened. How do I, you know, have a respectful conversation or whatever the issue is? It doesn't really matter. And I hear you that it's fear. Um, 
it, it always is fear when we create separation. I think the big inquiry for us right now with each other is how do we bridge that? You know, how do we bridge it societally and in our individual lives? And I, I'm just curious if you have people in your circles that have different views that you're practicing acknowledging the fears and bridging the separations with right now because a lot of us live in very cocoonish type social circles where we don't actually we don't get involved with people who are thinking and looking different than us well i'm in the middle of that right now with a uh, facebook friend uh, a young lady i've known for many years and, and you know the my friends, the leads I follow, you know, they're all, you know, my political bent, which is more liberal. And I, she posts this angry diatribe against the liberals, against Joe Biden. Um, and, and she said, I've been hearing this enough, this this um, anti-Trump in it. It was an angry, angry monologue. And I wrote back and I said, I can understand your anger. And because I care about you so much, my heart breaks for you that you're this upset that your nervous system is in this much turmoil. Regardless of the president, the president-elect, it doesn't matter in this moment. What I care about is you and your body and your health. And I'm so sorry to hear that it's in turmoil at this moment. And when we both settle down, then we can then we can talk, but not when you're in turmoil or when I'm in turmoil or when we're scared of each other. You know, we have to settle down and, and take that deep breath and, and let what you, what you said in, in your meditation tonight was kind of activate that parasympathetic nervous system. You know, the, the part of the nervous system where we go, it's okay. I'm with you that it's like a two step in the sense that I feel like we need to do what I call taking a, a U turn, a U turn meaning instead of me focusing on what's wrong with your views and fixating outward, I go back to my own agitation and upset and fear and anger and find a way to come back home to a place that's more spacious, more caring where I see the others upset and I'm, I just care that they're so upset. Um, but first I need to calm myself so I have the eyes to see because when we're reactive, we're in a trance and we're not seeing the whole picture. If I'm reacting to you, um, I can't remember the human. I'm just reacting to certain conditioning that's coming out. I'm reacting to the way your fear expresses basically. So I feel like we all need to have the kind of heart and mind trainings that let us calm down enough so we can see each other more truly. So we can actually start to understand how did you come to believe that? We may not ever agree, but at least we can understand more, which actually allows us to not be violent, <laughs> you know? I wrote it column for the Philadelphia Enquirer a long time ago. Uh, and, and one of my most popular columns, I, I wrote four words that can save the world. Four words that will cut down on divorce, conflict, international conflict. So what are those four words? Tell me your story. Sit down, look in someone's eyes, and say, tell me your story. It's such a gift to give someone. And then sit down and listen with 
you know, a curious mind and an open heart. And that it changes everything, you know that. Yeah. It takes um, a certain consciousness to truly be interested and want to listen and understand. So, but, and I think that tell me your story is our way through. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So maybe to bring it um, to something a lot of people wonder about and struggle with, you have had decades and decades of experience working with pain, physical pain just real, raw, physical pain. And we're so rigged to be afraid of it, Dan, that most people make it the enemy and leave their body, their heart, you know, you know, kind of leave town when it's painful. What, what are some lessons, you know, anything you wanna share about that? Well, a couple of things. Um, you know, we had talked earlier about how healthy our bodies are, how smart they are. So when we feel acute pain, that pain demands attention, which is a good thing. You know, we deal with it. The problem is when pain becomes chronic, like mine, or, or um, living with the sudden death of a loved one, both physical and emotional pain laid up in the same area of the brain. I found with my physical pain that when I first start, oh, ouch, when I first started experiencing it, I said to myself, this is agony. I can't live with this. I don't want to live with it. What if it ever gets better? Great works of fiction. I stopped telling stories. Pain is pain. That's all it is. It's pain. It sucks. <laughs> it hurts. It, my pain doesn't hurt any less. But when I stopped telling stories about it, mm. Mm. that it just became pain. And um, boy, it doesn't hurt any less. Mm. Um, God knows I don't enjoy it. But, you know, it's there and it goes, it's, you know, it's uh, my, my pain is, is, you know, like, like the uh, cousin who's uh, a pain in the ass who shows up at your door. You know, they stay as long as they stay and they leave when they leave and you got to live with it. You know, it's okay. it's okay. It's a cousin that's familiar. Well, what you're saying totally resonates. I mean, the stories are what create the suffering. The pain is completely unpleasant, but the suffering, the emotional suffering comes from the proliferation. Yeah. That trip to South Africa, my daughter was on it with me and we were in a van and we're driving down a, a, a rutted road and you know, all that movement, I was in agony. And she's sitting across from me watching her father be in agony. And, and I saw the look on her face. My heart went out to her. And, and when we got back, I was okay. I was back to baseline in fairly short order. And she wasn't. And I put my arms around her. And I realized the difference between pain and suffering. Yeah. I felt pain she suffered. Broke my heart. Yeah. I'm just listening and taking in, hugging your daughter and mm -hmm. uh, caring and feeling her caring and also the way it got tightened into suffering. So what it makes me think of, Dan, is that you see really clearly how we tell stories and get ourselves in trouble. And you also have this really um, beautiful eye for the basic goodness underneath our storytelling. Like I'm thinking of your daughter and those you engage with, you have 
this capacity to um, see goodness and to have other people feel good about themselves when they're with you. And I can speak personally because that's what that's what you do. And I I call that being a mirror of goodness. And I love the way you do it. And I just wondered if maybe you'd speak to that a little bit, you know, how that happens for you and, you know, how, how that's emerged in your life to be able to offer that to people. Um, all those people calling into your radio show that you made them feel good about themselves. I don't know. I think it starts with my insecurity. When I first started the practice, um, when people came to me, I was grateful that they came. Um, and, and when I first started giving lectures, I felt so grateful to the audience for, for coming to my lectures. Um, and despite the fact that I'm not as insecure, I still feel that gratitude, um, feel grateful to you for allowing me to love you. And, and that's how it feels inside my body. It's just gratitude, you know, love and, and gratitude, and they all get mushed up in there together. But I, you know, I feel gratitude, anybody that wants to have a conversation with me, willing to, I just feel, grateful for, for their trust if they open up with me. I, just, I really feel grateful and honored. You talk about gratitude probably more than most people I know. And that's a, a beautiful, remarkable thing because you described it. You set your bar at a certain place where you are just like wide open, receptive to life, you know, really, really grateful. Um, did that was that like a, an insight in a flash or did that gradually unfold over time that you became a grateful type? Yeah, I, I think it unfolded over time. I think every time, every time I came close to death, which has been four or five times, um, uh, I just grew more grateful for, for mm -hmm. life. And I had an experience a couple of weeks ago, where um, I'm sitting in my office and um, my blood pressure shot up. And when it does, it, it's, it's my autonomic nervous system and usually signals something's wrong with bladder or bowel, but it's almost always bladder. So I called my nurse and she came up and my catheter got kinked and I was soaked. Back we go into the bedroom. She puts me on the lift, gets me in bed, cleans me up, puts another pair of pants on me. And when it gets three quarters of the way up, my catheter bag sprung a leak. Off come the pants. She's got to clean me up again. She puts on a third pair of pants and I go back into my office. She comes into my office later that afternoon. And I said to her, you know, I'm having a really good day. She looked at me and she said, why? And I said, it's been four hours and I haven't peed in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> so you sit the bar that low, you gotta be happy. <laughs> It was true, too. I believe it. I believe <laughs> it. Well, you have fun with your life. I mean, you have fun setting the bar low, and you genuinely take in the life that's here and get touched and appreciative towards it. I do. I have fun with my, my mind, too. I mean, I, yes. It's, it's <laughs> like a playground. I, I, sent, I sent Joan my, my love. I sent her a text the other day and I said, I'm sad. So of course she calls me right away. And she says, what are you sad about? I said, John, I just realized 
I'm going to have to spend the rest of my life inside my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing that you and your mind are good bedfellows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. We spend a lot of time together. <laughs> I have, uh, you know, more than we have time for, but I want to kind of hone in on one that's uh, one thing I've been thinking about and mulling over. That's a big one for me. And it has to do with forgiveness and with how deep our conditioning is to turn on ourselves and be unforgiving and how, and again, this comes back to our divided society, how blaming and unforgiving we can be because it feels to me like we need to soften and open our hearts and i think a lot about our prison system in terms of this i, I go onto a societal level and the backstory for me is that when i was in college and this was 1971 or two or something um, i taught uh, yoga in prisons and I remember getting close to one woman, African-American woman who was part of a leftist type group. And she was in prison for a number of years I could not even imagine at that phase of my life. And it just broke me up. I mean, I was actually more than being heartbroken. I was really, really upset, angry about it. Cause here she, it's a super bright woman who in her mind was fighting injustice. She hadn't killed anybody or, committed violent acts. She had been with others who had, but here she was and her life was being wasted in this prison. And then over the years, I've become aware of how, you know, in the United States, we incarcerate more people than any country in the world. I mean, we're the worst in the world and how heavily weighted it is towards people of color. It's really our, it's like the tool of our hierarchical society to keep people down. And I mean, basically just the lack of compassion in our society and it's reflected in how we are individually, that we are just so harsh with ourselves and with each other. So this is a kind of a long-winded opening to whatever sharings you might have about it because I'm so upset about our justice system, so upset about how unjust we are with ourselves and each other and not upset in a, a way that um, contracts me as much as just now breaks me open. Yeah, when I feel into it, Tara, I could, uh, I could cry about the injustice. I've uh, treated people um, who had been in prison um, And the suffering they endure in there, and, and um, somehow they hold on to their humanity um, and seek redemption and deserve redemption. Um, I did a TED talk at the women's prison in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and I get to hang out with the women for most of the day. And a couple of them were there for the rest of their lives for something they had done 20 years ago. I said, oh, God, well, what, what is this? What are we doing? Um, and they've got no hope for parole. Why? What, what, why? You know, theoretically, you know, if we put people away forever, theoretically, we take them off the streets forever, we'll feel safer. But you know the opposite happens. You know, we feel less safe. The more we put people down, the less safe we feel. It breaks my heart. Ultimately, what we want is, is a sense of security. And, and the wider the net is, the more secure we'll feel. The bigger our network, the more secure we'll feel. Instead of putting our foot, literally or metaphorically, on a group of people. Yeah. 
I did a little research and, and it starts with Ecclesi Ecclesiastes, not that I'm a biblical scholar, um, where, where it said in there, you shall imbue the head of the goat with all the sins of the people and banish the goat forever. The scapegoat, that's the mm. origin of the scapegoat, mm. carrying all the sins of the people. Mm. Well, it's really looping back to what you were saying before is that our um, violence and just the ways we harm each other come out of fear and that the survival brain thinks the thing to do when you're afraid is get rid of what you think the cause is. And that's the survival brain, get rid of those people. If we can just get rid of those people or if we can just get rid of that part of ourselves, then things will be okay. And the wisdom mind knows that it's by embracing, not getting rid of. Sometimes it's counterintuitive. You know, a lot of times it is. I'm back to, to my pain, to everybody's pain. You know, our instinct is to clench around it, which makes yeah. it worse. And the invitation is to see that and explore what it means. Uh, one, one of my teachers says, when you meet your edge, soften. What does it mm -hmm. mean instead of tightening to just experiment softening and, and including and saying this belongs until we really are saying this belongs to every part of life, this part of our heart. So let me just check with you and sense if there's anything you had kind of hoped we'd touch on or wanted to add or just opening it to you. No, what I really wanted, we touched on. And that's simply that love is the magic sauce. You know, that's the magic ingredient. And, and the more we have, you know, I was at a place that said they were wheelchair accessible. And, and I was going down a ramp and my eyes looked over. It was in a, a, a club, a, a comedy club. And my eyes looked over at the audience and there was a step at the end of the ramp and my wheelchair seized up and I went flying out and landed on my face. Um, I had a subdural hematoma, I retorked uh, my neck, my spinal cord, so that my left arm, and you've seen me, left arm's been flying around today. Um, my left arm, my dominant arm, was completely paralyzed and I couldn't move. And, and I said, ah, I can't do this again. Now, I, I, I can't survive. I don't want to. Losing a third of my body again. Um, I, I just can't. And, and then one day I was laying in bed and I was thinking in the hospital and looking at my arm and then I looked out the window and I thought about all the people I love. Mm. And my body felt warm and larger. And then I thought about all the people who love me mm. and, and my body felt so large. I, I thought it was gonna break through my skin. and. And then I looked down at my dead arm and I said, almost out loud, it's an effing arm. Look at all the love I have in my life. That's the magic sauce. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I love you, Tara. And I love you, Dan, and I really, I'm imagining friends that are with us right now just to take that in and know that if we could enter this next moment and this next year remembering what we love and remembering the love that's here, it would ripple out in the most mysterious, powerful, beautiful way to hold our lives, really. 
So thank you, Dan, from all of us. Uh, it's, it's been, been a, a pleasure. It's been a pleasure and an honor.